Hey everybody, this is Adam Kokish. I'm here with Kyle Davis in Grand Junction, Colorado. We just had an awesome event here, thanks to him, on the American Campfire Freedom Tour, the Mesa County Library. And Kyle's got really an incredible story to tell. It might have been a while since you've seen two guys on YouTube wearing Iraq Veterans Against the War t-shirts, but yes, this is it, representing here tonight. And Kyle, I know uh, people are gonna be eager to hear about the personal development, the challenges you faced after that, obviously running for office as well. Oh yeah, how that, that fits yeah. in everything. <laughs> but first, I think people need to know your military background. First, where did you enlist mm -hmm. and why? So let's see, September 11th happened. I was in high school as a sophomore. And you know, just as with the same with everybody, I knew that things aren't gonna be the same anymore. And I remember in 2003 when the statue of Saddam Hussein got yanked down. I was watching that on the news, and <laughs> I had beautifully choreographed. Oh yeah, piece of yeah. There's there's no way that was set up. Propaganda. <laughs> but uh, I remember watching that on the news, and you know I grew up in a very conservative household. I was a Republican as much as a high schooler can be, really. Um, and I just had this this feeling. It's like I'm probably going to end up doing something over there. I wasn't thinking about the military at that time. I was too busy being a high school dropout. No, excuse me, I have to, I have to uh, take you a step back here because of something else you told me earlier relating to your family and going into this and the effect, mm -hmm. you know where I'm going with yeah, this, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> the effect that joining the military had on it, your family because you were on a different path. Yeah, you were, yeah. You were going atheist away from a Christian conservative family. Yeah, right? yeah, so yeah, I grew up my grandpa was a preacher. We went to his church in California. We always grew up in a very, they were very religious, very like, we'd go to church every Sunday, youth group every Wednesday, we would do that. And then come 13 years old, I start like <laughs> reading the Bible. And man, this, none of this is making sense. The and cognitive I, and dissonance starts piling Exactly, up. And, and I'm not the kind of person who can just let things that I think are wrong lie. Like, if I've always been somebody who I have to get the last word in if I know I'm right and you're wrong, even if it's to my detriment, uh, which happened all the time. Even if you get stoned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so This is especially ironic given that we're in a church right now. Just as we an are, aside, yes. another aside, we are actually in the room where Kyle puts together Concerts death metal and, yeah, shows death metal. and so, raves in the back attic of a... It's, a, it's an interesting. It's an interesting thing, and I, they do it. They allowing me to do this, knowing I'm an atheist. But <laughs> yeah, so going along, I started questioning my religion around 13. Um, I came out to my parents after years of just studying it myself. Um, told them like I'm I'm not a believer anymore, and they put the hammer down. I am a cancer on the family. I'm going to rot in hell. I'm going to infect my brothers. I wasn't allowed to be by my brothers uh, for much longer after that. Um, so my relationship with my father was really fractured at that point. Um, then I turned 18 after dropping out of high school, getting my GED. I'm sleeping on a fringe couch, a friend's couch, and I'm just stagnant, not doing anything. And I can't do that. Like, and so I, I need something. to redeem something. yourself um, in the eyes of yeah, your I, I, conservative Christian family, you went off and? I, and like, Dad, I'm thinking about joining the military. <laughs> and that was the first time my dad actually looked at me uh, and talked to me. Because before, before then, it was you like, okay. You can be my son again. Yeah, and right there, there was, I, the beginning of that connection was, was coming back. And so I was reassured that this is probably the right decision for me. Plus, you know, I had the feeling that I, I wanted to be a part of what was going on over there because I fully believed that what was going on was the right thing to do. Um, so I, I enlisted. I, it, I thought about it for about two weeks and then I was off. I, I, I'm the kind of person where I make a decision and I just go with it. Mm -hmm. So I uh, joined the military, went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, did all my basic training and, and everything there. And first duty station was in Oklahoma. Everything I did was in Oklahoma, pretty much, which I, yeah. <laughs> I know, I, 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 did, I, I did my artillery training at Fort Sill, and um, to use the coarse military language that we did, if Florida is the penis of America, Fort Sill is the asshole. Yeah, we called it the armpit. Yeah, the some, armpit, some stinky, yeah. sweaty, disgusting area is, is what that is. <laughs> well, we, were you in Lawton? Yes. Okay, yes. so, yeah. I lived in Lawton. Okay, so, for, yeah, we had the Marine Corps Artillery School at the Army yeah, Base. Yeah. 
And it was just, it's the, when you think of the prototypical army base being surrounded by pawn shops and used car dealerships and strip clubs and tattoo and parlors and hip -hop strip club, clubs yeah. you know, and yeah. hip hop clubs <laughs> yeah. of, of military guys in slacks, you know, like. It's all there. It's yeah. Lawton, they, they have it. <laughs> yeah. It was actually rated one of the most dangerous cities in the country, Lawton is. <laughs> So that was reassuring. <laughs> Stray artillery shells? That could have been, yeah, because you hear it all the time. But uh, yeah, so I, I went and did all that. Um, in 2005, we got word that we were going to deploy. And I was uh, transportation, uh, or I, I, rather I was artillery, because I was there at Fort Sill, but we reclassed as transportation. So we flew out. Um, and we were stationed in Kuwait at Camp Arif John. Uh, which is just this huge hub of uh, various people and all the branches. And I mean, there's so much money thrown into that base. And Kuwait's a cool little area. But uh, that's where we were stationed. But we were, since we were transportation, we got to drive all around Iraq. Like, we were not stagnant for very long. If we were, we spent, we spent about a month in Ramadi, uh, which people called at the time Fallujah Part Two. Um, so we, uh, we spent some time there and uh, be in transportation. It's fairly dangerous, especially yeah, at that time, time. On the road, what on happens the roads, driving yeah. around Iraq? There's, there's uh, these people there who don't like us, <laughs> and, and they try and blow us up. Oh, man. yeah. So uh, it's a so popular good way to go about it. resisting martial law. Yeah, which you know, it's weird because they, uh, they're not a military, <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're fighting a military, and they were winning. Uh, if, I may, <laughs> if I may, like jump ahead because I have to interject the like big yeah. philosophical points every time I see it, just because it's so cool how you articulate articulate that in connection to your story. When, when we, as people who believe in the real message of freedom as voluntarists, talk about national defense being conducted better without a military, in pretty much every situation where you've had an organized guerrilla resistance, you can see, and even in this modern age of the hugely mechanized, digitized military of the United States of America. It's still an uphill battle for, for the military. Well, no, who won? The, the insurgents won. Oh, yeah, won they won. The yeah, they won. Like, yeah. even dis with. Well, Halliburton yeah, really won. Yeah, <laughs> you, I mean, you'll hear that we lost Vietnam. Yeah, we, we lost <laughs> Vietnam. You'll hear that all the time, right. but you won't hear that we lost Iraq. You know, not yet, not yet. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> we still got some, some distance some, some to place ego between us. to let go yeah, of, yeah. some yeah, psychological distance, be able to admit that they were wrong. Yeah, it takes a little bit, but... Um, so, so what happens? You're driving in Iraq a lot. Yeah, so you, you, know, you encounter a lot of bombs. And over the course of uh, you know, a few months, uh, we get hit quite a few times. Um, and I never got hit directly, uh, but... Over the, you know, just after three, four times, things apparently started to rattle around and I got hurt. Uh, started having seizures while I was in Kuwait. Um, <laughs> this is like, well, I was in combat and just started having seizures. No, yeah. <laughs> I mean, people were getting blown up left and right. Who cares? I'm, well, it, it, I'm in the middle going like, ah. And, and what sucks, though, is that, you know, I, a lot of people were, you know, going the whole, you know, route of trying to go crazy because they didn't want to be there. <laughs> and, you know, I'm Lingering. like, yeah, I'm like, come on, you know, this is kind of ridiculous. And I, I got sent to uh, Kuwait City first to do some tests, and then they sent me to Germany. And they said, you know, if things turn up okay there, then you can come back. And still, despite some of the stuff that I was thinking and some of the things that I've seen, uh, which already had me adjusting the way, my perception of what we were doing. Um, I still wanted to go back because I, it was kind of a, a source of pride. I, I didn't want to get, have Same my ego kicked. Yeah. You know, it sucks. It yeah. sucks to all your, your buddies are over there still fighting wait, wait, and you're sitting, getting sent home. Did you get a purple heart? No, no, this? never got a purple heart. Because um, that's, that's, that's kind of crazy. I mean, you have like a, a distinct wound of, yeah. of something that's wrong with your brain. Like but there was, it, was never, it was never one solid... Thing. Never broke the skin. Yeah. So I mean, because I had. And a there, guy, there's, a, there's a lot of people with TBI who don't have purple hearts. Yeah, I, I, we had a guy on on a team that was there with us who got like a nick on his cheek, like lit still, literally, yeah. like you know. That's all it takes. Yeah. Few hangnails <laughs> yeah. right there. Yeah. Well, that was from Shroud. Like it might not have been. It might have been that like his, his vehicle was hit with an ID and he or he sunglasses. Like sunglasses like, you know, cut him. Yeah. Himself and was like. 
you know, he's bleeding at the end of a fight and his officer goes, oh, Purple Heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. you end up yeah, starting there, to have there, seizures. There, there was nothing. And I was also kind of the outcast of the unit. Like, I'm a metalhead, so I was the weird guy listening to the weird music, watching the weird Ooh, movies. There's that guy in every unit. Yeah, and I was him. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it, that put me at, I was kind of ostracized and you know, not saying that that had any factor in that because I think anyone in, in my position probably Most people would've. got screwed one way Yeah, or yeah, definitely. But so, so you yeah. went to Germany. So I went to Germany and I ended up just getting sent home. Um, well, now, just to be clear, the, tr the, the trauma was several IEDs. It wasn't like... Yeah, like come, coming into really close contact with them, whether they're on the... That, was it your vehicle? You were in a Humvee? Our, our, uh, I was both in Humvees and in HETs, heavy equipment transportation systems. So huge, huge trucks that were you know, heavily up armored and you know, we would haul Apaches and you know, yeah. Abrams. Yeah, so it was your and, vehicles that had gotten hit by yeah, IEDs. Yeah. At least three our, times. Our, conv our convoys. But you, and near the me. vehicle you were in personally. No, it never got seriously slammed. Really? But close. Okay. Like, like we all within but our convoy. Yeah, so enough to where we can feel the yeah. actual shock from it. And to be clear, one and of it the doesn't things, even take a whole lot to to fuck your brain up. Yeah, one of the things that people don't appreciate about traumatic brain injury in the occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm sorry, I just have to like as an aside. There's there's the, this great meme, you know, about American sniper where someone says. You know, America is such a screwed up country. Not only will we send troops over to your country to kill a bunch of innocent people, but we'll come back 10 years later and make a movie about how killing your people made our troops sad. sad. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, just, just with that sort of, you know, <laughs> in mind, we're not trying to be like, oh, yeah, poor, poor us, because, you know, the, the victims of war are not. How, how would our attitude be yeah. toward a movie made about the. Insurgents yeah, about how they feel. Yeah, killing American troops, which are very like real that. emotions. Not not to say that the emotions that the people coming home with aren't real. Like, uh, you know, PTSD is a real thing, but they have it too. Yeah, and and, 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 and they're living with this shit every day, like around them. And by the way, <laughs> I, I used to do a lot of work, you know, for veterans specifically. I led a self-help group for vets with PTSD, and I I can't really, in good conscience say, we need to put a lot of effort towards taking care of vets when the government is still, well... Producing vets with this yeah, ailment. Exactly. And, and, and just in perspective, you know, one in four children in Fallujah, I was born with birth defects. I mean, I was there. You know, depleted uranium. You, oh, yeah. It's oh, it's, 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 like, it's I'm there. sorry. I, I don't, like, hey, let us smoke pot, okay? But, you know, <laughs> the, the idea of, like, you, you want to, like, you know, build houses and spend millions of dollars helping out American vets, it's sort of like, no, the, if, you, if you're aware of that situation, the victimization really needs to be put in perspective. It's there. But, yeah. but for, for guys like Kyle, uh, the traumatic brain injury, what I, what I just want to make sure people understand is that, uh, you know, for the artillery rounds that I was firing mm -hmm. in training, it's a 100-pound HE bomb. It's an artillery shell that has a killing radius of 50 meters, a casualty radius of 100 meters, and the concussive effect that can literally rattle your brain is probably several hundred. Mm -hmm. And with the IEDs that we had now, I'm, I was very fortunate. I had a, a couple con uh, convoys that hit IEDs. I was like far enough away, didn't really get the effect, but I felt it. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and I've yeah, you known still, that. And yeah. that's the crazy thing is it's just like, you know, a concussion for an athlete, you don't know. Yeah. And it builds up, and then next thing you know, you're having seizures. Yeah, it's weird. It's, you know, I've had many imaging tests done, and it's hard to tell. Like, it really is hard to tell, unless I'm in there, you know, while I'm having a seizure. Then they'll be able to maybe pinpoint exactly what's happening, but they're so sporadic. And now you, you know, only experience them? Every three to five months. And I, I, still, I still get them pretty consistently, like no matter what medication they ever gave me. Right now, I'm not taking any seizure medication because the side effects Are worse, were yeah. <laughs> worse than the seizure. So, and especially when I was going to school and I would take pills that would literally make me think, it would take me 10 minutes to try and form a sentence. You know, I'm trying to write my history thesis and like this just isn't, isn't going to work. So, so, we, so no, no, more, uh, no more medication. We joke about pot, but it is really one of the great ironies of this point in American history that you've got the conservatives who are go troops and go global war on terror, and, but and pot should be illegal. Freedom. And there are all of the, the, I mean, two primary specific conditions, well, I mean, you could say three, that troops are coming home from these wars with that it are held all of those. almost only by pot, at least very uniquely, and that's PTSD. And for PTSD, as I've dealt with, it's a symptomatic treatment. It's not a cure, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, for guys with chronic pain, 
you know, there are a lot of people with, with back. In, I mean, my back was a little messed up. Not terrible, but yeah. I understand, you know, the, your posture when you're with, with a flat Gear jacket and, and a, yeah. you know, Kevlar, yeah. uh, you know, and, uh, plates and you're in a, strapped into a Humvee all day, whatever it is, um, or, or with weight on your back. And those guys come home and it's like it's the kind of strange chronic pain where yeah, yeah. marijuana really or is the only safe thing. Knees. knees. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Lot. Knees are, like, knees are still bad. Out combat, you know, yeah. just the kind of rigors they put you through. Um, and the other one is, is traumatic brain injury. And there's so many things that, uh, for, so Kyle, if you would, for, for you, mm -hmm. what role has marijuana played in dealing with seizures? So it, it, at first it would seem like they were kind of, it was, it was reducing the frequency. Um, but it, as it turns out, that really wasn't playing effect. But I will still have a seizure. I'll still have them every three to five months. Um, and little different ones. Like I, when I have a seizure, it's a grand mal. So I'm down on the floor and I'm, you know, full muscle spasm. Uh, and when I wake up, it feels like someone has the back of my eyes in a vice and they're just twisting. And <laughs> I can't stop writhing because my muscles are just in so much pain. So I will grab a pipe and I will take two hits off of it and just kind of try and lay down. And it's like someone takes a healing blanket and puts it on me and I just feel it all throughout my body. I'm able to relax and I'm able to eventually fall asleep, uh, which is the only thing that I really want to do after that because I'm in a lot of pain. And that's the only thing that'll put me to sleep. I, I mean, I've tried taking you know, the Xanax and the Ativan right afterwards and that, that doesn't help the pain. This has multi functions and it, it's, been the closest thing to a miracle that I have experienced. Yeah, and I, I mean, I can tell you from experience, just from when I did the peer support group in DC, uh, vets who come, come home and, and turn to alcohol, or yeah. even the prescription crap yeah. they yeah. gave you at the VA. Like when I went in and told them I was having trouble sleeping with PTSD, they gave me five prescriptions, three of which had suicide listed as <laughs> yeah. a side effect. Yeah. And I go, oh, <laughs> great. Yeah. Um, and and I, I could tell that the guys that turned to the, the, the synthetics would crawl into bottles and destroy their lives. And the people that smoke pot, at very least, can step back and address their problems from a rational yeah, perspective exactly. and talk them through. So when, what out of all this, I mean, how, how did you not come home loving this war? Why, why well, did you join IBAW, <laughs> you freaking commie trader? Uh, I had a platoon leader. Uh, his name escapes me, but he, he was uh, definitely a lefty. And he wasn't a big supporter of the war, and I, I was always kind of confused as to why he joined the military in the first place. But he was um, noticing some of my conservative leanings, and he started, but he also noticed that I wasn't dumb. Like, I, I, had, I had a certain intellect about me. Uh, the weird guy usually is the smart here? guy. Like, I, yeah, I li listen to the death metal, but he maybe has some brains. So he started giving me, you know, some of his literature that he had, and he had a bunch of Noam Chomsky. Um, which valid points. A lot of the stuff, you know, I'm not completely anti Noam Chomsky, but uh, you know, his, his whole—he's a socialist. But some of the footnotes yeah. are really what got me. I started like I, I'm a footnote maniac, so I start you know researching footnotes. And in the back of one of the books he gave me was uh, Ron Paul speech was was given as a footnote. So I go to the computer lab and start looking at some of his speeches and reading some of his writings. I'm like, well, a lot of this is actually kind of making sense. And then I start seeing things, um, like what really get, gets me thinking is seeing kids with, you know, assault rifles going in and shooting at us. And they have no chance. You know, they're an eight-year-old, 11-year-old kid, and they're going up against this giant military force. What is motivating that? At what is that breaking point where they say that this, this is what we're going to do? At what point, putting myself in, in their shoes, do I reach that point? So I'm like, I, none of this is right. Like, I, I don't like seeing eight-year-olds and 11-year-olds shooting at us. I don't like seeing eight-year-olds and 11-year-olds die. Uh, and I'm a part of this. I'm, I'm a part of the re either the reason why they're doing this or just the reason they're dying. So I'm uncomfortable. And I start listening to Ron Paul and reading Ron Paul and kind of other footnotes and um, that, that's kind of it got the, the wheels turning but I'm also in it and I don't want to be the guy who's changes his mind right there and all of a sudden like starts preaching anti-war when I'm just right there so I'm, I'm kind of quiet about it for a little while and I come out and uh, 
That, that's when like I really start researching even more, and then I realize that this whole, just like religion, it starts, conservatism just starts not to be consistent. It was the inconsistencies in the Bible that really got me to start thinking like, this can't be right. It's the inconsistencies in conservatism that made me think this just can't be right. And so uh, I start looking for different outlets. And uh, I, I saw a stump speech here in Grand Junction actually by some members of Iraq Veterans Against the War. And I'm like, you know, this is uh, two years ago. I would have been, fuck these guys, but you know, it makes sense. So it was this recently, two years ago? No, 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 this, this, this was, I got out of the military in 2007. Okay. Uh, so it was really, it was in 2006 that I started, the wheels started turning. Okay. I made the full conversion to calling myself a libertarian in 2008. Okay. Um, so and it was two years before that, that you were thinking, that you thought, wouldn't have been ready to hear this. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So you know, I would not have in any way been able to handle that. I probably would have went up on stage and made a fool out of myself. So what was the final thing for you that gave you confidence in saying, I'm not a conservative anymore, I'm a libertarian? Um, it might have been the fact that John McCain got elected, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, he that he was the one there. Um, well, something gave you the intellectual confidence to say, this is a different worldview that well, I'm embracing. Yeah, I, I think it's, so I, you know, I, I'm an atheist because I don't know. I don't know what's out there. I, I can't with any confidence say that there is a God or that there isn't a God, but I'm not a theist. I'm pretty sure that what they're saying is, is wrong. Um, I'm a libertarian because I realized that same thing, that I don't know. I don't know what is best for you. I don't know what is best for the world, but what I can tell you is what we're doing right now probably isn't the best. And none of it justifies yeah, exactly. Killing. aggression yeah. of any form, uh, right? Exactly. And you've it, gotten it, to that point. I, you know, I, I just, yeah, <laughs> the, the, the whole non-aggression thing didn't really happen uh, until a few years later. Like, I, I was already, I was, you know. This, I was, this I was, is what I'm getting at, to, to the bottom of the rabbit hole. Ex exactly. So there's, there's. It's a constant evolution, and I'm still not done. You know, I'm still not done growing and learning. And one, one of the, the quickest ways to uh, make sure that you are right is to speak out publicly, because people will tell you if you're wrong. <laughs> and I was really good at speaking out, and people would tell me I'm wrong. And you've probably <laughs> already left a comment in the comments below yeah. about how wrong he is. About at least. And I'm sure you've like. probably seen a few <laughs> in past. I don't videos. know. It's happened occasionally. <laughs> I don't know. I think everybody who watches this YouTube channel, they they just they agree with me on everything. I'm yeah. pretty sure, hmm. right? Yeah, Even the stuff that contradicts the other stuff. <laughs> but that's it. Really, like as soon as you start speaking out. People are going to start correcting you, and you know, I, like I said, I, I like to be right, uh, but I, I so I, I'm not completely dismissive of people who tell me that I'm wrong. So I ask questions and I, I, I speak loudly about the things that I believe, and then someone will challenge me, and I immediately know when they have something right because I start stuttering or <laughs> I, I, I start like uh, you know start backtracking or like not really knowing what to say. When generally, when someone presents me with something, I, I have something for it. Right. Uh, when they present me with something I really don't have an answer for, I'm uncomfortable and I don't want that feeling again. So I'm gonna keep looking into it. So I was very public, uh, very very loud in college when I started college. As soon as I got back out of the military. And the evolution just keep, kept going. And really it was um, Stefan Molyneux who got me to, to accept the non-aggression principle. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I came across him because I was doing a presentation on what libertarianism is. And <laughs> he popped up and I've been hooked on him ever since, even though he's wrong on a lot of stuff. And he's <laughs> too white for me sometimes, <laughs> but <laughs> the tour of the colonies accent. Yeah, but uh, there, it's it, it's a constant. Um, I, I'm consuming as much information as I can. Still to this day, I, I'm, I'm consuming books and videos and uh, engaging with people whom I agree with and who I disagree with because that's the only way that I can confidently build myself up to where I'm. I want to be as right as I possibly can be. And so I'm, I'm not afraid to be wrong. And I'm probably wrong on most everything. And, I, and I'm okay with that. 
So there's been a part of your personal development as well that, that's in line with some of the more recent themes of, of my message and, exactly, and, and the exactly. book Freedom in particular. Can you talk about how you've been able to connect that message of social freedom or larger external freedom to internal freedom? So joining the military for me was not necessarily motivated strictly out of fear or hate, but they were factors. <laughs> uh, you know, there, there's that, that fear of what's going to happen if we don't go over there. There's the fear of what's going to happen if there's another 9-11. What's going to, uh, the, the hatred of the people who did those types of things. Uh, so those were all factors. Um, coming out of religion even, you know, and I was an angsty teenager when that was happening. So yeah, anger was definitely a, a factor. Um, you but, mean metalheads are? Yeah, that, that's a, that happens. Metalheads sound angry, <laughs> but... Uh, it's really because they're tender souls expressing... Exactly. Well, ...frustration with the harshness of the world outside. And we just like banging our heads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, Sometimes there's anger. Yeah, it, well, and also it's, it's a positive outlet. It, right, it, it, it is a way to channel whatever emotion it is that you have into just rocking. Like, and, and, and that's it. And that's, I've always found solace in that. And I, and, I found and part of this is that Kyle is in a band here, if you want to yeah, yeah. plug uh, in, please. Check out Murder Cafe. You'll, <laughs> you won't like it. Uh, but You'll love it. <laughs> the, uh, the, the motivating factors for a lot of things have been anger. You know, lashing out. Uh, to, one of the common uh, arguments against atheism or atheists is, you know, why are you so mad at God? And it's like, well, I'm not mad at something that doesn't exist, <laughs> but I was angry at being lied to. Yeah. I, I was angry at being forced to be something when I was too young to even make the decision myself. Um, so yeah, I was angry at those around me, but I think, I think it's natural, especially when you're younger. You know, teenagers have all the hormones that are mixed, the, all those weird cocktails in your brain, and you, you just get angry. and. Um, with age comes experience and uh, a little bit of calm. And we've been doing yoga. Yeah, well, exactly, <laughs> which uh, I, I'm actually, you know, six months in and I feel great. And that actually has helped just with, because it's, it's focusing on what is good inside of you. And there is so much good inside all of us. So the trying to get people to realize that one, you don't have to hate. You don't have to be afraid because as soon as you start living your life afraid, then you start making rash decisions and you really start, that, that's when aggression starts and you, you start uh, being aggressive towards other people. And that's why we are in where we're at because there, there's not a, a realization that people even really are being ag aggressive. People don't realize, like, all of your videos, people don't realize immediately that taxation is aggression. It's, it's a, they don't even think about it. So there's, there's that cognitive dissonance in so much of what I once was, conservatism in, in religion. And coming out of that, you know, after going through the stages, and I think it's completely natural to go through stages. There's stages of grief, there's stages of anger, there's all this kind oh, of stuff. Oh yeah, no, and, and just so people appreciate this, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons I, I want to bring our audience stories like Kyle's is to show that there's this process. I mean, for me, it was a 10 year one. Yeah, you know, yeah, it, it, it's, it's not like a light yeah, switch. that included going to war in the process, exactly. and especially <laughs> when it includes giving up a religious belief, and it doesn't necessarily for everyone, but any time that you give up what you built up in your mind, not in reality, but in your mind was a piece of yourself, and you give that up and you have to let it die because you know it's based on a faulty foundation, there's, there's a process of mourning. And, and oh, yeah, mourning it hurts. is a multi-stage process. Exactly. It's, it's really important to acknowledge that, that even as, as for anybody who's any kind of libertarian asking a statist to not be a statist when their de their identity is you know tied to nationalism tied to their ideology they have to give that up and and, and they might you might win an argument with them but that doesn't help the long-term process of you know grief regret sorrow letting go which is you know really what it comes down to right no exactly exactly and there's it takes a little while to for you to 
love yourself. Like, and, and that you can't spread the message of love if you still don't quite love yourself. And I'm not, I'm not there yet. You know, I, I don't think any of us are ultimately where we want to be. What? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> You especially sad. have a long way to go. <laughs> but there's, there's, there, everyone is on a journey and it doesn't stop. You know, the, the road is just forever. And I've made plenty of mistakes. I don't talk to my brother right now because I didn't realize that the way that I was communicating with him uh, was hurting him. And I, 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 I miss that. Like, I, I wish I could take that back. There's, there's lots of things that, because of the way that I handled it, because I was right, I was in the right, and the way you're looking at things is wrong. It's unempathetic, and it's a form of aggression. As opposed to what we're trying to do with this tour and with the message right now of shifting the culture of the freedom movement to getting away from debating and zero this sum. To that. Yeah, yeah, I'm right, you're wrong kind of conversations. So, hey, check out this amazing thing I figured out that's made my life better. And exactly, that's the key, is, is what has made my life better? Because I have accepted this message and the way of life, and I am living my life according to its principles. Yeah. If, if you're sharing something that makes your life worse, you're probably doing it wrong. But if you, if you haven't figured out how <laughs> this understanding or this perspective, this attitude that Kyle is such a great example of can make your life better, then you, know, you got to figure out that before you share it. So finally, Kyle, can, yeah. we, can we play with the sign for a little bit? You want to hand this over? Yeah. Here? And, uh, These were all around town. Uh, I haven't seen a campaign sign as beautiful as this actually on the street anywhere in America. Uh, obviously, you're not running as a Republican or Democrat. You, was it officially I was, yes, libertarian? I was officially a libertarian. So yeah. yellow is great. Yellow and black is especially great. And mm -hmm. the voluntarism V in yeah. the middle of the I think, you campaign. know, it kind of just goes by most people. Um, but the people who knew, they knew. But that wasn't the point. The point wasn't to, split, to, to preach to the choir. Uh, I, I could do that with my friends on the weekend. The, the point was, and, I, and I, I went as a libertarian because um, it was an easy process. They needed a, they needed someone in the race, and I had still I'd maintained my, my my affiliation with them just since 2008, I think, and uh, they just needed somebody, and they knew that I was active here in town, so. Literally, they're at the convention in Denver, and they're doing the roll call. Going, this is District 54, so they're at like <laughs> District 20, making all the things. They're like, Kyle, we still don't have someone for District 54. Would you consider doing this? Yeah, yeah, I guess I will. Um, there, there are many reasons the incumbent was a piece of shit that I really wanted to go after. Uh, he ended up not running, so I ended up running against three other people: Republican, Democrat, and Independent. Um, but I did this because you know, the, the process of getting on the ballot was simple. Well, well let's just, the, 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 I, I want to get down to the purpose of this, but let's just compare it to not being a candidate as an activist when you want to get out and you want to share a message with your community. How does that compare? Well, it's, to, it's, hey, it's, now it's, you're a candidate. Well, now we need to decide whether or not we're going to vote for you. Exactly. Why don't it's, you tell us your thoughts on some things? So, so it's, it's very difficult as an activist. Uh, here in Grand Junction, we have a very active community. Um, they will go, they'll, they'll schedule events at the courthouse. They'll have open carry events all the time. Um, people will drive by. Those people are weird. I'm staying away from those guys. Uh, all the people that are going at the event, they don't need to hear the message. But the people who are maybe undecided as to who they're going to vote for, they're going to go to the debates. They're going to research the candidates. Um, this provided me a place to go on stage and speak to people who, here in Mesa County, America, conservative heartland, uh, I believe that much of what I had to say, they connected with. Um, I, I didn't dumb down my message. I, I tailored it to a crowd, but the you message is the compromise. same. No, no, I, there's no compromise. And I, and I will say things that probably make people uncomfortable, but you do that all the time. And that's what causes people, people to change. Think, yeah. So this provided me an opportunity to get in front of people and speak. And uh, I got shut out of some debates just because I was a third party uh, candidate and they were only accepting of the Republican and the Democrat. 
which really, when you got right down to it, like the Democrat doesn't have a chance in this town either. So why even? Let him? <laughs> uh, but but we went up there, and I I was successful in that. I mean, I lost horribly. The Republican. Well, because you're not trying. You're no, not, yeah. The, the goal was clear. not to win. This is exactly. a Democratic campaign. When you run a campaign like this, you focus on getting news stories, getting in debates, getting in front of the crowds that the government has so conveniently put together for you. Exactly. Not doing voter outreach, not doing fundraising, not knocking on doors. None of that like really boring the crap stuff. of being a campaign. Yeah. You know, this is and, and I've I've my like when I ran for yeah. office, it was more of a serious campaign where we really had and, and you don't want to do that. You know, like if you if yeah, you, you were all to, dressed up in a suit. That. Yeah, I put on like, a suit. Like, yeah. I, I was that guy. I, I didn't wear a suit. Like <laughs> I, 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 I wore I wore a vest and I looked presentable, but no tie, like casual. But it, it, it really did provide me an opportunity to go out and actually speak to people who, they would see me on stage and they would see my enthusiasm and they would make the connections that what I believe, like this guy's saying a lot of the things I believe. The philosophy might be a little much. Like I, I, I don't know if I can completely get behind uh, the, the, the implications of this philosophy, meaning like, okay, all drugs kinda should be legal because if you don't own your body and your own consciousness, then You're you own absolutely free. nothing. Yeah. So, you know, that's hard. That's a hard pill for people to swallow. But exposing them to that message, especially people who are active and actually wanting to consider, like seriously consider who they're going to vote for, they're going to think about it a little right. bit. Right, and you're providing gateways. Exactly, and that's all, that's all that it was. people are ready for that, they're going to pull you aside after. And they, and they did, and I had a lot of that. And some of the most uh, reassuring things that happened was when I would talk, spend an hour with someone after an event. I'd talk to this one person because they just had so many questions. Yeah. Uh, who, you know, they, they're super conservative, but they, they connect with it. But they have so many questions. And then I, I'd spend an hour with them, and to the exclusion of everyone else who maybe wanted to say something, but I, I would spend all that time with them, and then I'd see them again at another event a month later. It's like, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that conversation, and I don't think these guys voted for me, but... But that was probably the turning point for them. It is. And, and that's, that's what's really important about what we're promoting now in, in terms of what is effective activism, what wins converts. And if you provide that turning point, you provide that gateway issue for someone, and electoral politics creates the mechanism for that, think about a day of activism. You get to go give a speech in front of a room full of people you disagree with that you, you know you're going to be able to at least poke into some different mode of thinking. And then you get one guy who really engages, and you get to provide him with that turning point. That's a great day of activism. I mean, if, like you, it is. if you could do that every day, I mean, imagine that if every libertarian could get up on stage and talk to a crowd and win one convert every day. That'd be it. Which, which is one of the reasons why, I mean, I, I signed on to the Free State Project uh, 2006, 2007. I'm just waiting for the 20,000 to hit and <laughs> to convince my wife to allow us to go over there. She <laughs> married me knowing I signed it. But, you know, that, that's such a great idea because, you know, concentrate a bunch of activists into a very small area and see what happens. And it's pissing a lot of people off right now over there, but they're making, they're making a change. And they're providing an example for people. Rush Limbaugh has, is, has praised a lot of what they're doing on the things that he agrees with. Right, you know, firearm so, civil disobedience. Exactly, and, and so there, there, it's a very, a very real effect. Yeah. It can, can happen for people who can show the empathy it takes to connect with someone one-on-one. -on -one. And you have, to, you have to be patient, you have to be empathetic, you have to be tolerant of whatever it is that they're saying, uh, and, but you just have to respect them as an individual. You don't have to respect ideas. Do not have to respect bad ideas. Yeah. But you have to respect a person until they prove that they don't deserve it. But everyone you meet is deserving of it until that point. And man, the Republican, at least the Republican that I was running against, you don't get that feeling that he even cares. That, that he's, he's trying to make a connection with you because it's not about change. It's not about ideas. It's about power. And I think that's what we're fighting against. So this provided me a, a great vehicle to, to, to speak with people. Way, way more effective than just being active and, and doing open carry protests and, and doing all the various things that you people do as an activist and that are, are in some way effective that they, they, they do good
but this did great, and I was beat the hell down. Like, I, I, they, they dug, like, I never thought that I was going to run for office, so I lived my life. <laughs> like as, a normal person. As if I wasn't going to ever be in the public eye. And that's why normal people never get elected to public exactly. office. Exactly, and that's really too bad. <laughs> I, I, and and I, I've had a lot of conversations with people about that and, and about psychedelics and how they really have helped I mean, that's the closest thing to a religious experience that I've ever had in my life. And that is because I'm, I'm experimenting with my consciousness. Do I not, why don't I have that right? Why don't I have the right to, to experiment? Well, you experiment with that every time you pray. Why, why can't I do that just by eating some fungus or something? Like there's, <laughs> there, there's it's, it makes, and, and talking to those people, it makes them uncomfortable, but they realize somewhere, somewhere in there, well, you know why psychedelics right. are illegal, right? Because if everyone did them, we wouldn't have a we anymore. Free minds are impossible. <laughs> it, to it wouldn't control. be we. Well, Kyle, I really appreciate you taking the time with us tonight. Definitely, man. I and appreciate I, the opportunity. I just want to give you one last chance to tell our audience if there are any particular lessons learned, maybe for for other activists or for other Iraq veterans who are maybe still somewhere along the process. Yeah, I, through. I think the most important thing that anyone can do is. One, focus on yourself. You, you have to be able to be confident in yourself. You have to be able to love yourself. And take that and show empathy to others. Empathy is probably the most important thing that you can possibly show to anybody. It shows that you actually care. And, you know, I've made many mistakes. Like I said, my brother, I miss my brother. And it was because I was an unempathetic asshole at that point in time. You want to say something to him? Yeah, Alan, dude, I miss you, and you should really come back around because... You won't do it again. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> like, I, I realized that positivity takes many different forms and different people. I listen to metal, and I find that very cathartic and very positive. Not everyone else does, and that is completely okay. Find what works for you, whether that is writing a book, whether that is uh, knocking on doors, I mean, that, that's kind of not very effective. But whatever. <laughs> that's, that's not good therapy, no. <laughs> of all things. Like, it works for you, but, yeah, no, but don't start with that. There's something out there that, that is going to work for you. And really, the only way you're going to find out what works is if you know yourself. And until you know yourself, you're not going to be as effective, I don't think. And so I'm, I, I really think that uh, the, the message of uh, your message, the, the message that you're sharing, freedom, uh, is one that is vitally important and one that people understand. People know it. They just are having a hard time accepting it. So is there anywhere online you want people to be able to connect with you, your music, before we close off? Um, I, my, my campaign website's still up. <laughs> uh, so you can get a hold of me through there. That's uh, davisfor54.com. Uh, all my information is on there still. Uh, or you go to Facebook and look up Murder Cafe. That's uh, where my music is. But it's, uh, I, 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 I'm still there because people still want me to run. They're, they're still asking me to run again. So I'm like, all right, I'll, keep the, I'll pay the $15 and keep the website up. But uh, yeah, man, I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate you coming here. Kyle Davis, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm freedom. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel, share this video, and check out thefreedomline.com for free book downloads and all your freedom gear needs. Thank you for protecting us from his penis. How many terrorists have been caught by the TSA? Hello, Adam. How's it going? How will you take my guns away? Wow. You're not going to do it by chanting.